had I had more than this, then I would have given you more than this, just out for the respect for the Quran. And if this is how much respect he had for his, you know, for, for his Ustad, for his Usun's Ustad, how much respect do you think he had for his own Ustad, his own teachers? He himself says, مَا صَلَّيْتُ صَلَاةً مُنْزُ مَا تَحَمَّادُ إِلَّا إِسْتَخْفَرْتُ لَهُ وَلِوَالِدَتِي وَأَبِي وَلِمَنْ تَعَلَّمَ مِنِّي وَتَعَلَّمْتُ مِنْ Since Hamad Amir Sulaiman has died, by Allah, every prayer that I have offered, after that prayer, I have made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking Allah to forgive my teacher, Hamad Amir Sulaiman, to forgive my mother, my father, my students, and all my teachers. Not once in his entire life he ever spread his leg or pointed his feet towards the house of Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman. And like, this has got nothing to do with being permissible or impermissible. It's nothing. And there were seven streets from where he lived between his house and the house of his Ustad Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman. But not once did he ever stretch his legs towards that. My friends, you know, this is how you acquire knowledge. You know, with this adab and ihtiram. And the respect that he had for the other muhaddisin was phenomenal. Musr ibn Qudam, that very man that died in prostitution, he says, it was the habit of Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullah alayhi, that all the, muha- you know, the muhaddisin, whatever he would buy for himself, he would buy for the muhaddisin. Whenever he bought clothes for himself, he would buy clothes for the muhaddisin. And in fruit season, whatever fruit he took for his own family and children, he would buy the same fruit and give it to the muhaddisin, the senior masters. You know, the great Ibn Uyayna once received a gift from Abu Hanifa, and when he saw the size of the gift, you know, he was so smart. And he came and he began to complain to the companions of Abu Hanifa, okay, look at what Imam Abu Hanifa has sent me. You know what his companion said to him? Okay, my brother, this is nothing what he sent you. If you look at the gifts that he sends to Sa'id ibn Abi Uruba, you would not even count your gift as a gift. And what he would do was, he would, he was a businessman. He would buy goods, he would send money to uh, uh, Baghdad, buy goods, and sell them in Kufa. And look at, look at Allahu Akbar. And the profit that he would get from selling these goods, he would, with it, he would buy food and clothes for the muhaddithin, for the masters of hadith, those that would do khidmat of the hadith of Rasulullah. And whatever he had left over, he would give it to him in the form of cash. And on top of this, he would say to them, don't praise me, I haven't given you anything. All I have done is whatever Allah has bestowed upon me, Allah is using me as a means to you, and I'm giving you this. His, his students were like, were, you know, he treated his students better than you and I treat our children. Many of his students were, had a yearly allowance. Some of them even would have even a monthly allowance. And Allahu Akbar, there were those like Imam Abu Yusuf, he says, and he was a student, that Imam Aniva rahmatullah looked after me and my family for 20 years. 20 years he paid for that everything. 20 years. I like it should be the other way around. It should be the student sporting the Ustad. And here Imam Aniva rahmatullah was sporting everyone. I mean, every Friday he would make sure he would order for special food to be cooked for his students. Every Friday, but he would not participate once. No, once would he participate in this? And he would say to them, if I'm here, you people will not eat to your full. You know, the character that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him was amazing. Absolutely phenomenal. You know, such was the respect that he had for his mother. That Muhammad ibn Bishr al-Aslami relates, لَمْ يَكُنْ أَحَدٌ بِالْكُوفَةِ أَبَرُّ بِعُمِّهِ مِنْ مَنْصُورِ ibn al-Mu'tamir wa Abi Hanifa That in the whole of Kufa, there was no one more uh, obedient to his mother then Mansur ibn al-Mu'tabir and Abu Hanifa rahmatullah alayhi. Mansur ibn al-Mu'tabir would go as far as even combing the hair of his mother. While Imam Hanifa rahmatullah alayhi took it upon himself that every Friday he would donate 20 dirhams. 10 on behalf of his father and 10 on behalf of his mother. And this is other than what he would donate on a normal day. And as I've mentioned, after every prayer, not a single prayer would go in which he wouldn't ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive his mother and father. <coughs> Such was the respect that he showed to his mother, that you know, he was without doubt the most knowledgeable person of his time. But you know, in, 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 in front of his mother, all he was was Nu'man. Little Nu'man, you know, just like you and I, it's so possible that you could be the world's best doctor. But when your mom becomes ill, she'll still go to the local doctor. 
She'll still go to the local. It happens. You know, many of us may be scholars in our own houses, but to our mothers, we're still that little child. And she will still ask someone else. So, Imam Abu Hanifa, rahmatullah alayhi, to his, to his mother was only Nu'man. And when she had problems, she would ask him. But at the same time, she would say to him, Nabutar, go to uh, Umar ibn Izzah. There was a scholar, local scholar, who was a very good storyteller. And she was fascinated by him. She had a lot of i'tiqad, aqidah, and muhabbat with him. After asking her own son, she would say, Nabutar, can you go and ask Umar ibn Izzah and tell me what he has to say? Now, he was the greatest scholar of his time. You know, he wouldn't say to his mom, Mom, what are you doing? You're humiliating me. No. He would go and he would go to Umar ibn Izzah. Now, Umar ibn Izzah would be shocked. He was Abu Hanifa doing at my door. And Imam Hanifa rahmatullahi would say to him, hey, My mother has sent me to you. Umar ibn Izzah would then ask him the answer. Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi would tell him the answer. Umar ibn Izzah would then repeat the answer to Imam Abu Hanifa. And Imam Hanifa would then go home and tell his mother, okay, this is what Umar ibn Izzar had to say. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, just like any other mother, she'd say, okay, look, no, I want to go with you. <laughs> Imam Hanifa, rahmatullah alayhi, you will not find once, once in which he said no to his mother. He would escort her on a mule and he would take her to Umar ibn Izzar. And when Umar ibn Izzar would see Imam Hanifa, rahmatullah alayhi, his mother there, he'd be shocked. And he would say to him, why did you tell her? Imam Hanifa rahmatullah would say, look, I've told her, but she wants to hear it from you. Then Umar ibn Izzar would say, what Imam Hanifa rahmatullah has said is correct. No, so trustworthy he was, that you know when he died, those that have written biographies upon him say, that in his house they found things were, which were kept in his trust worth in those days five million dirhams. You know, my friends, people don't give their cash to anyone. That's a fact. You know, people think hundred times before they give somebody something that is valuable as a trust. Do you understand? And people have left trust with him in those days, you know, five million pounds, you know, it was, it was like a bank. This is other than what Imam Hanifa rahmatullah alayhi had already returned. You know, if this is how trustworthy our Imam was with regards to the dunya, how trustworthy do you think he was with regards to the deen of Allah? You know, the character Allah gave him was amazing. Once a person, one of his enemies slapped him. He said to him, Okay, my brother, I could so easily slap you as you've slapped me. But I won't do this. I could complain to the Khalif, which would get you in a lot of trouble, but I won't do this. I could wake up during the night and complain to Allah of this oppression, but I won't do this also. I can wait for the day of judgment and ask Allah for justice. But I assure you, my friend, I won't do this also. If I receive my certificate in my right hand, and Allah accepts my intercession with regards to you, then I assure you I will not set foot into paradise without you. You know, his enemies, I mean, there was, he had many rivals. You know, the bigger a personality is, the more people you have that are jealous. The more people can't see the sight of you. And it's all down to rivalry and jealousy. So what would happen sometimes is one of the locals, you know, they would hurl abuse at him. Now he's walking home and one of these locals is hurling abuse at him. And what they wanted was to try to get him to respond so they could catch him out on something. So they kept on hurling this abuse, hurling this abuse. You know, Allah had given him such a character and such tolerance that he would just listen to everything. Listen to everything. Finally the person got fed up and said, Hey, do you think I'm a dog that I keep on barking and you do not respond? And when he got to his house, in another narration it is mentioned that he gently turned around and said to this person, Look, my brother, I have now reached my house. If you're not satisfied, then I'll wait here for you and you can keep on hurling abuse at me. Till you yourself tell me I'm satisfied and after that I will enter. My friends, it was as a result of his character in one narration you will find that even a Majun, a Majusi, a fire worshipper, he declared, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. This margin owed him some money. Imam Sahib went to get, ask for the repayment. Now as he got to his house, he realized that his uh, shoes got some filth on it. He took it off, shook it a bit, and the dirt flew onto the wall. Now, you know, to these people, you know when you're a godly person, that everything becomes worrying. Now he realized that the dirt is on his house. He can't leave it there, but if he takes it off, he'll end up taking up some cement. 
Now these people were conscious of everything. Okay, what if Allah holds me accountable for this, that I haven't asked permission, and I've taken off some of his uh, cement? So this is what began to worry him. So he knocked on the door, the door was open. The slave girl informed her master that Abu Hanifa rahmatullah is at the door. Now, her master came thinking that Imam Hanifa rahmatullah will ask for the repayment and began to offer excuses. Yeah, on the tongue of Imam Hanifa rahmatullah was, okay, my brother, this is an incident that's happened. I would be grateful if you could tell me as to how you would allow me to take this dirt off your house wall. Now, he was gobsmacked. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. And in that gathering, seeing the piety of Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullah alayhi, he declared, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulallah. You know, every aspect you know, is more or less near perfect. Nobody can be perfect other than the prophets of Allah. This is why I'm using the word, you know, near perfect. It's like, you know, Allah has, you know, Allah has done everything himself. You know, businessman, what type of businessman? I mean, a woman comes to him and asks him to sell some cloth for her. He asks her how much. She says, a hundred dirhams. He says, it's two less. Two hundred, two less. Three hundred, two less. Four hundred, two less. Now the woman thinks that he's messing around with her and he's joking with her. He says, go call your husband. And he purchased that very cloth which he could purchase for a hundred dirhams. He purchased it for five hundred dirhams. Every aspect, Allah had blessed him. You know, so conscious he was of the akhirah, my friends, that many a times he received great gifts. You know, numerous amount of money. But he wouldn't refuse it. And it was as a result of this that he didn't refuse, that he refused you know, the position of chief justice when it was offered to him, which finally led to his death. He was offered the position of chief justice on two occasions. Once when Ibn Hubayra was the governor of Iraq, Ibn Hubayra called all the great scholars, and he, Ibn, Ibn Shubrama, Ibn Abi Layla, and others, and he gave them all a position. He called him Abu Hanifa, alayhi, and he said, You will be chief justice. You will have the official seal. You will pass all the uh, judgments. And you are the one that will be in charge of the public treasury. Now Abu Anifa rahmatullah Ali wanted nothing to do with this and refused. Now Ibn Ubayra took an oath that if you refuse and don't take this, then I will punish you. Imam Anifa rahmatullah Ali was very adamant. All the scholars came to him because they feared the consequences. They said to Imam Hanifa rahmatullah Ali and they tried to reason with him and said it would be good if you uh, take this up. We were all forced to take this. We don't like these positions, but we have no choice. Imam Hanifa rahmatullah Ali was adamant and said, even if he tells me to count, to count the doors of the masjid, I won't do this. I won't do this. And then he said, how can I put my seal of approval when this man passes an execution order, tells me to kill someone? How am I going to show my face on the day of judgment with my stamp on it? I will never accept it no matter what he does. And just as was feared as a result of this, Imam Hanifa rahmatullah alayhi was thrown in prison. Fifteen days he remained in prison, and Allahu Akbar, he was lashed a hundred and ten times. And throughout he was told, accept the position and you will be. Accept the position and you will be. But he didn't accept the position. So much so that the executioner began to fear that if we keep on hitting him like this, he will die. As a result of which Ibn Hubayra then freed him. And the day he was freed, he began to cry. And the reason he began to cry was, he said, the grief of my mother was far greater than this beating and lashing that I received. Okay, what will have my mother have feel, felt, knowing that her son inside prison? And what would she have gone through? That fall and that grief is far greater than the beatings that I've received. The great Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahmatullah alayhi, you know, himself was, was, was lost many a time. Every time Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal was lost, he would remember the lashing of Imam Hanifa rahmatullah alayhi, and he would pray to the Almighty Allah for him and he would ask Allah to forgive him. The second time he received this uh, position of Chief Justice was when the Kharif Abu Jafar al-Mansur called him but again Imam Hanifa rahmatullah alayhi refused. As a result of which he was thrown in prison yet again for a second time and again he was told time after time but he would refuse. As a result of which what would happen is every day they would take him outside and in the marketplace they would make you know, announcement and he was lost every day. And then he was made to walk in the market covered with blood. When this got too much for him, and then they started putting constraints with regards to his food. When all this was too much, he prayed to the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, complaining of his own weakness. No complaining about these people, complaining of his own weakness. He was complaining to the Almighty Allah. 
And after this dua that he made, five days did not pass, after which Imam Hanifa Rahmatullahi passed away. Some narration is mentioned that whilst he was in prison, they kept on giving him a glass to drink. But he would keep on refusing. They would insist, but he would keep on refusing. And he would say, look, I know what's inside that glass, and I will not assist in my own death. Finally, he was thrown on the floor, and this poison was placed inside his mouth, as a result of which he died. In some narration, it is mentioned that Imam Hanifa Rahmatullah Ali, well, now when he perceived that these are his ni- nice uh, last few moments, and the angel is going to take the soul, Imam Hanifa Rahmatullah Ali fell in prostration. And whilst he was in the state of prostration, Allah took his soul. So he died in the state of sajda in the 150th year of hijrah. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have blessings upon him. So accepted he was that 50,000 people offered his janazah. His janazah, khatib baghdadi al shafii says, was, uh, was read over six times, the last of which was led by his son. And Fadl ibn Dukain says, narrates from Ali ibn Salih in his tarif, that people kept on coming to his grave for over 20 days just to offer their janazah namaz. My friends, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq. You know, not just Imam Hanifa rahmatullah alayhi. You know, we're very just and fair people. Allah give us the tawfiq to revere and respect all our imams. And Allah give us the tawfiq to respect our salafu salihin. You know, in this day and age, you know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, he, you know, the latter part of this ummah will curse the former ummah. And this is what we are witnessing. You know, in this era of internet, everyone's, you know, a homemade scholar. And, you know, they feel that, you know, what they do is, is far greater than what, than what our salafu salihin did. Na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfuzina. You know? Yet, we are all indebted for our iman to our salafu salihin. Had it not been for the effort of all our imams, all our muhaddithin, all our muhbasirin, today you and me will not be saying, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. In this age of fitna, where the, where the latter part of this ummah is cursing the former of this ummah, my friends, people like you and me, we should, stood, we, we, we should stand and we should continually convey the same message wherever we go, praising our salafu salihin and relating their virtues. Allah give us the tawfiq to understand. Who Allah doesn't give the understanding, my friends, can never learn. Allah give me the tawfiq. Wa akhiru dawana anil hamdulillahi rabbil alameen.